So in lesson one, we talked about the Bible, and in lesson two, we talked about salvation. But now I want to kind of come back to something that, that I briefly mentioned, touched on, I want to kind of look a little bit more at it. Uh, first off, some more proof of God. Now, ultimately, and we'll get to this, uh, testimony is, is one of the greatest proofs of God, but um, there are, that doesn't mean that it's the only proof of God, and there are, are other proofs. However, this class is not meant to be apologetics in its focus. It's not meant to um, be as a witness to someone who doesn't believe. It's only meant to strengthen and disciple those who do believe. So th there, there have been noted a, a, a few different things, and I'm just drawing attention to a few of them, um, about things that, that point towards God. Uh, the first is, is the way that creation itself has order and complexity. Uh, the way in the way DNA is composed, um, the way that um, that the, the life has its little cycle of, of ways that, that things feed other things that, that then feed other things, the way that trees provide the oxygen for people and people provide the the uh, the carbon for for trees, and the way that everything has a cycle to it. When something dies, it's taken up by another species, which is taken up by another species, which is taken up by another species, and they eat each other. And there's this this chain of this chain of, um, of of order, or the way that, 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 that there's seasons and there's um, there's times of the year, there's there's different variations, there's different this, there's different that, um, and and so what people have sometimes said is that everything just um, evolved um, by 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 chance. Um, and so in essence, what they're saying is that hum is that Mother Nature is God. So there, and if you follow that argument, it's not really disproving God. All that you're saying is that Mother Nature is God. So Mother Nature was able to to devise this perfect system, with with you know no mistakes or anything, with all this precision, with all this th th this order, and just by happenstance, that that's not coincidence. What you're saying is, is you're saying Mother Nature itself is God, and all that we're saying as Christians is that is that. Um, Mother Nature isn't God, but but God is God, and He's the one who created this. And the reason why there's things like diseases and stuff is because we have sinned, and so decay has entered the world, um, which once again points toward the fulfillment that Jesus will come one day again. Um, that He need that 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 things need to be set right. Um, but then another thing that uh, well, I'll come back to that. Um, but so the, uh, creation's order and complexity itself speaks of. Um, of a creator, uh, but then also the fact of morality, the fact that, that regardless of what somebody says about truth being relative, if you go and steal their TV, they're not going to be cool with it, because morality is not found in the experience. Morality is something that has to be an objective, reasonable fact in order for it to truly be morality. Um, if morality is found in what is best for humanity as a whole rather than from God, Okay, because some some would say this. Okay, morality is is the natural conclusion of what is best for man as a whole. Well, first off, how do you arrive at that? Because in our nature, it is in us to only to only watch out for number one. You don't believe me? Live in America for a few days. <laughs> People are only really cared about only really care about themselves. Um, so if morality is found in what is best for humanity as a whole. Um, a few live by that, and not only that, but a few can live by that. That would mean <clears throat> that if you have AIDS, um, to prevent the rest of humanity from getting AIDS, you know, uh, you would have to make absolutely sure, which it would either be abstinence or um, or killing yourself or killing those people who have AIDS or whatever. Okay, well, it ju it's justified because I'm killing these few so that these don't get disease. And I know that AIDS is kind of a bad example, but surely you can see where I'm going with this. That that would mean that that little evils would be justified as long as people as a whole were profited, or at least thought that they were profited. In which case, you may even be able to justify the Holocaust. Because, well, what if it, what if, see what I mean, where that person's understanding dictates what's best for the whole. Or if it's, if it's what society as a whole deems is, is good, that doesn't really make sense either because that would mean that tr it, it's not absolute. Good, right and wrong is not absolute. It is just simply um, uh, time. 
that, that makes something right or wrong. In other words, slavery was right at a certain time, although it is not right at this time. See what I mean? The truth no longer becomes absolute. The truth doesn't matter anymore. Rather, time does. What time we are in makes morality matter. So that really doesn't hold a whole lot of water to it. Or if you say, okay, morality, what is right and wrong is what is best for me or what is not best for me. Well, that doesn't make, really make sense because what is best for you is kind of a little bit subjective. For instance, it may taste good, let's say, to drink, um, I don't know, lighter fluid. Let's just say that that tastes good to you, um, but it's bad for your body. In the same way, let's say that you don't see anything wrong with child molestation. Okay, just roll with me on this. If you don't see it as wrong, then according to your definition, you, you have the final say. In other words, you are God, and you are making that thing. All that we are saying in Christianity is that, you know, Mother Nature is not God. The person is not God. Society as a whole is not God. God is God, and God decides what is right and wrong because it's according to his character, which is objective because he is not human. He is not held by desires of the flesh. Okay? Um, so no matter how you mask it, we as people do have desires of the flesh. Um, uh, so anyways... Um, So if morality is found in what is best for humanity as a whole, few live by that, yet it's in our nature. Okay. So, I think I said all that I wanted there. Basically, my point is this. If you follow the logical conclusion of where did morality come from, you arrive at the fact that there has to be something separate from nature, okay, separate from creation, They came up with this. Um... You know, if, if, if religion just came up with it just for poos and giggles, first off, that benefited the mass population. Um, so religion would then, even without God, be of some benefit. Um, second off, you know, sometimes people are so biased against something that they don't see what's clearly in front of their face. Some people say that religion is inherently bad because of religious wars. Well, historically speaking, only a few wars in history have been caused from religions. Most have been caused from other causes. Um, in fact, religion is the cause for most morality. I mean, let's say you remove God from it, and it's not in our conscience at all. Well, then this religion, who you know cooked up law and good, um, was able to... Um, and was able to, to change an entire society. And let's kind of roll with that. If religion created good out of just just to create it, something that was not in existence, what did they model, off, model it off of? See, philosophically speaking, they would have had to create something that was not in nature, that did not exist, that was in no way, they couldn't have had anything to model it from, and then said, okay, so there's going to be something called good and there's going to be something called, called bad. Where did that? Where would that idea have come from? So then there's the idea of pleasure. The fact that we can experience pleasure. Um, when we have sex, there's that connection between our spouse. Um, when we... Um, um, when we go shooting or, you know, not necessarily hunting, but, but you know, shooting, or, you know, some people draw pleasure from that. Um, when you, you know, get a pedicure and these different things, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for nature to evolve pleasure. It doesn't do anything to benefit, per se. And some people would say, oh, well, it does do something to benefit um, because <laughs> people find more fulfillment when they enjoy pleasure. Well, okay, but where, then where the heck did this idea of, of fulfillment come from? If we've all just evolved with no purpose, well, first off, we have no purpose, and therefore we shouldn't have to feel fulfillment because we have no, no purpose. Our purpose is to simply exist. So why do we not find pleasure in simply being? So then, you know, you, you are led to different schools like, um, you know, higher thinking and those kinds of, kinds of ideas. Um, but ultimately, the, those teachings offer fulfillment in nothingness. Well, I found my oneness. Your oneness with, with with what? And what does that what does that do? So all, all your whole purpose in life, the the reason why you're created is to find fulfillment. That does nothing to expand life as a whole.
See what I mean? There's just such a contradiction in, in thoughts there. Now, I'll let you kind of do more research on that yourself. Uh, but then the idea of beauty, the fact that we can see things and they can be pleasurable to see the, the beauty that we behold. Um, the idea, the, simply the idea of perfection itself kind of demands that there should be something perfect in, in essence. Um, you can't, your mind cannot comprehend something that, that is not and never has been. Um, but the greatest testimony is the testimony of the changed life of a believer. Ultimately, you can argue till you're blue in your, in blue in your face if somebody is not ready to, to listen to the gospel. They are not going to listen. That's just going to be that. Um, but when they see something different than you, when they see you loving without expecting something back, when they see you forgiving and truly forgiving, when they see you passing up harm, surrendering your rights for the betterment of someone else, when they see you see you serving other people, it's going to make a difference. John, in the book, the Gospel of John says that they will that the disciples will be known by their love. So. So it has been said that everyone has a God-shaped hole. That no, one, and I just kind of added this in there. It's a, it, it was described as, as a vacuum. I forget who said it, but um, oh, I wish I could remember. It's, it's skipped my brain, but um, it, it described as a, as a, as a, it's, a, it's a vacuum within your soul that, that's God-shaped. Um, but I just added this on and to the end of it that no amount of drugs, money, or partying can fill. When people who get money want more money, people who do drugs, I mean, they may feel good for that time being, but then they always have that crash. Uh, people who party and, and, and try to find the fulfillment in doing the things and whatnot, whenever those things aren't there, or whenever they aren't around, there's a sense of emptiness. So, and that takes us to God's character as revealed in his revelation, uh, the Bible. So, first off, he's unchanging. Now, what does this matter? God will always be the same. He loves you today, and guess what? Tomorrow, he's going to love you. Yesterday, he loved you. Um, he, he, he doesn't change. It's not like, okay, well, now I've reached a place in my being where I have learned something, or, oh, I didn't see this happening, or I could, didn't foresee that that was going to happen, or, oh, that caught me off guard. So, I mean, God is unchanging. Those things don't happen to him. So yet God feels and acts and responds. Let's say that. Let's say that. First off, he feels in time. Although he knew something was going to happen, although he exists outside of time, um, although he's unchanging, he still does experience. Okay. Uh, Genesis says that God was sorry that he created. Um, that he created people. He was so grieved in his heart. He was so grieved that um, there was such evil. Okay. So at that time, he was, he was very, very impacted by it. Um, but he also acts. Just because God is unchanging doesn't mean that he can't act. Um, we see that throughout the Bible and throughout history today even, that God, that God does act. That God is, is sovereign even if we don't see it all, so him as sovereign now. Um, remember, faith is a belief in something we don't see. Um, and he does also respond. Um, Manasseh was a very wicked king of Judah, and, um, and as recorded in Second Chronicles and and Second Kings. And God, um, he he repents, and, and God God definitely did hear him. Although he does say that his repentance was not enough to turn back the wrath from the nation because they were all evil. Um, Sodom and Gomorrah, it says that in Sodom and Gomorrah, if there were just simply ten righteous people, that God would have turned. Uh, would have saved the city. Just simply ten. There were not even ten people doing the right thing. Um, you know, and obviously I could I could go on with the different examples. King Ahab, one of the most wicked kings of Israel, he repents and God heard him and forgave him. So um, there on I have uh, I, f I have a few listed um, verses, and so I just want to read that. The first one is Psalm 102. Verse 25 through 27. Of old you founded the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. Even they will perish, but you endure. And all of them will wear out like a garment, like clothing you will, be, you will change them, and they will be changed. But you are the same, 
um, and your years will not come to an end. And then Psalm 90, verse 2. Before the mountains were born, or, or you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Genesis 6, 5 through 6. Furthermore, I have heard the groaning of the sons of Israel because the Egyptians... I'm sorry, I'm in, I'm in Exodus. Genesis 6. I knew that didn't sound right. Genesis 6, 5 through 6 says, Then the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. The Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things, and to birds of the sky, for I am sorry that I have made them. Uh, but Noah, Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. I mean, I do want to point something out about this. Um, king, God anoints King Saul to, um, to 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 lead to become king, and he knew that Saul was going to mess up, but he still gave him that chance. He still gave him that choice. Um, he was not he was not ordained to mess up. In the same way, um, God's character. I mean. He did not ordain man to mess up. He gave them the choice, and they chose to, and they chose to withdraw from him, and this grieved him. Um, and so, once again, without getting too much into it, is it, first off, when you get into a troubling passage, remember that God is God. His ways are higher than your ways. Don't try to fully understand. Just throwing that out there. Sometimes God does things that he just doesn't explain. Second off, Understand that sometimes things are written in man's perspective, some things are sometimes are written in God's perspective. Um, third off, realize the idea of what it's saying, and it'll explain more of what the specific words mean. Um, so you know, when 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 God saw the wickedness of people, He was He was sorry that He had created them. It caused Him such grief that He actually um, regretted at that time making them. And that's pretty substantial. Um, so 1 Kings 21, um, 25 through 29. Surely there was no one like Ahab who sold himself to do evil in the sight of the Lord because Jezebel, his wife, incited him. He acted very abominably in following idols, according to all that the Amorites had done, whom the Lord cast out before the sons of Israel. It came about when Ahab heard these words that he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and fasted, and he lay in sackcloth and went about despondently. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Do you see how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself before me, I will not bring the evil in his days, but I will bring the evil upon his house in his son's days. So we see, once again, King Ahab there. Um, and we see we see God reacting to the things that happen. But however, um, God, although we do not understand, we do not know. You know, we can't say, okay, God will do this, unless He told you that He will do that. Um, in other words, we can't say, okay, I have God figured out, and this is how God acts. We can't say that because we don't know. But with that being said, we can know that God will not act against his character because that would be a change in his character. He acts only according to his character. Okay. For instance, God will never lie because he cannot lie. He is truth. Um, not to say in the form of what Christian science says, you know, oh, um, God is divine principle. That's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is God cannot act against his character. So... <clears throat> Although God never changes and sees beginning to the end, he is still personal and involved with the world. Knowledge of evil doesn't mean you are okay with evil. Let's kind of take that apart. God never changes. Okay, we talked about that. He sees beginning to the end, so he knows everything that's going to happen, everything that has happened. He is still personal, and, he, and he's separate from time. He is still personal. Okay, he is still a being that is involved with his creation. Um, and involved with the world. He didn't just build it and step back. We see that throughout history. Um, and what better way than to say Jesus himself? And no, knowledge of evil does not mean you are okay with evil. Okay, Just because God knows that evil exists doesn't mean he's okay with it. 
he has promised to create a new heaven and a new earth. Um, and he, he knew the possibility of Adam and Eve sinning, and he even knew, sinning, and he even knew that they would uh, do it, but he still gave them the choice to do it. Um, so God exists outside of time, yet responds within time. <clears throat> what that means that God has, exists out of outside of time is it means basically he doesn't age, he doesn't change, he's always the same. Um, you know, th this is this is basically what that means. So he is everywhere present. You know, Psalm one thirty nine. Psalm 139, 7 through 8. And I do want to say something about heaven. Sometimes people get the idea that heaven is a principle. That heaven is um, heaven is wherever you don't remember your mistakes or the bad things that happened. Heaven is, you know, all these, basically principle is what it's saying. But heaven is not a principle, it's an actual place um, that people go. Um, so people who are saved go. Um, where can I go from your spirit, or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me, and your right hand will lay hold of me. And it goes on saying there. but um, Genesis 3.8, which takes us to our next point there. Yet he manifests himself at times. 3 8. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So it has been said, yes, God did never leave, but his manifestation did leave. So um, he is all knowledgeable. 1 John. First um, John three nineteen through twenty says, "We will know by this that we are uh, of the truth, and will assure our heart before Him. And whatever our heart condemns us, for God is greater than our heart and knows all things." Um, and then Proverbs three five through eight. I read this in another lesson. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord, and turn away from evil. Um, so other gods, you know, created gods, always act according to human understanding. They always act according to what humans say is, is best, and what humans say is, is true. Um, or, you know, um, in the olden days, I mean. Um, even nowadays, the gods that people serve besides God uh, always have that human element to them. Um, so what people nowadays do is they say that they don't believe in God, yet they make science itself God. Science can only tell us physical things. Science cannot answer the metaphysical. Science cannot answer, you know, the mysteries of, of the universe. It can only um, it can only tell us about things that we can put in a test tube. But in a sense, we make science God nowadays. Um, or we make Mother Nature God, and that it just randomly evolved by chance into this perfect creation um, that, I mean, functions, it, it has such complexity to it, all these different things, and, it, and it's complete with morality. And it's just came into being by chance, or, you know, Mother Nature just had a way, or eternal existence, or people say matter is, is eternal. Well, that kind of contradicts Einstein. So that's not true, um, and we, we can we can date matter. Everything that, that that has matter, we can date. So with that being said, God must not be matter. But then let's say that matter has always existed. So you're making matter God. See, God by definition has to be eternal, or else he's not really God. God has to be unchanging, or else he's not really God. Anything that changes would then be subject to variation, which would then mean that it would it would learn and adapt and, and, and evolve in a, in a sense. 
Um, and in other words, that would make God God. That would make him simply a, a, a strong being in the sky, like a Superman almost. Um, it, 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 to, for something to be God, it has to be separate from matter. Since matter um, breaks, since matter has a beginning, since matter, you know, um, eventually um, things can have an end. People, things die, matter dies. So in its essence, that would mean that when a person dies, part of God dies. You know, God has to be distinct from it. Um, God, by definition, must be, um, you know, must be the source of morality. God, by say, I mean, what we've done is we've made God this, this weird thing that we don't understand that's up in the sky that hates people and wants to kill them all. And then we've contradicted that, contradicted that and said, okay, so see, I, I, I've done this. And basically what science is doing is it's creating what's called a straw man fallacy. And this basically misrepresents the truth of what something is and then um, argues against that thing that they just made up. Well, see, God, by definition, people say, well, you can't see God, so that means he's not real. No, you cannot see God, which means that he is not a physical thing, which means he ex exists outside of s space. Okay, see, definition. Um, well, you cannot, um, well, so everything dies, so God must die. No, that must mean that God, by definition, exists outside of matter, once again. Well, if everything has a creator, then God must have a creation. No, that's actually just kind of a stupid argument. God, by definition, has to have et existed eternally, which means that everything must have had to come from him. And, I mean, obviously, what if you saw a city underwater, and, you know, it, it, it's perfect, and you could go and live in it? Well, you must, have, you must assume that there must be a God that created this city under the water. So, um, but I'm, I'm getting a little bit off topic. <clears throat> he does not act according to our understanding, however, and I think that's pretty important. He's truthful where other gods lie and deceive. Even, even Allah um, is, is a deceitful god. But Yahweh, on the other hand, um, our, uh, the Christian god um, is, is a very truthful god. In fact, he's, he's, he's the... The, uh, I can't find this passage. He's the um, the standard of truth, right? Ch there we go. Chapter 23, uh, Numbers chapter 23, verse 19 um, says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? I want to point something out. You cannot believe parts of the Bible, because the Bible claims in whole to be God's revelation and be completely inspired by God, and, and be completely truthful. So if you reject a part of it, in essence, you are making it very subjective. You, you can't take away one part without taking away all of it, okay? Because it did say that all of it is. So um, it, the Bible is a book that either you believe the whole thing, you believe none of it. It really doesn't have a, have a middle ground, which is why Christian science really confuses me, uh, which is why uh, uh, Jehovah's Witness really confuses me. Why Mormonism really confuses me? Really, why cults really confuse me? They, they they take parts. They take parts. Hebrews six eighteen says, um, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we would have taken refuge. Uh, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. Um, so that takes us to some more traits here. First off, uh, and next off, actually, um, God is God is faithful. Acts two twenty one says, um, and it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Um, if you read through the book of Numbers, you see God knew that the Israel Israelites were going to mess up. Okay, God knew that they were going to do it. But he still gave them the chance. He still gave them the law just in case. So I mean, they ha he gave them everything that they needed to to obey him. And fortunately, they didn't let that get into their hearts. Um, and so they found themselves in conflict with God's character. Um, <laughs> um, and, but yet we see that he still made a way to continue his love to the next generations. We see that um, he still was faithful past their faithlessness. We see that even though he knew what they were going to do, he still gave them a chance. They still stuck stuck with them. Um, 
also, uh, God is good. He's a standard of good. Everything he does is good. Um, although we may not understand it, we may not understand the difference between what he allows and what he causes. We may not understand all these things. We may not even understand these things in glory. But all that we can know is that God is a standard of good because he created good and bad. So do bad things happen in the world? Yes. It's the effect of the fall. Sin always produces bad things. It never produces anything good. So people try to try to get God back by doing more evil. Well, that's about the dumbest thing. Evil is what caused your problem in the first place. Why did that drunk driver uh, hit that car and kill that person? Uh, well, duh, because the, God gave the person the choice. They chose to get drunk, and then they chose to dro drive. So, I mean, people cause, making, making choices that are contrary to God's character produces bad things. So we're not talking about becoming a robot here. We're talking about living life to a, to a fuller degree than otherwise. When you, are, when you don't serve God, you always serve something else. Okay. Now let's say you're an alcoholic. You're serving alcohol. You're serving yourself. Um, you know, and, and you're going to do by nature those things that alcohol requires. You're going to wake up with a, with a hangover. You're going to you're going to be uh, usually have a, usually have a problem with anger. You, you're going to be um, unpleasant to be around for a good deal of time. You're going to be depressed. You're going to have bouts of of struggles with different things. These are things that happen when you walk contrary to God. There's just there's no other th other thing that can happen. And that sounds like a heck of a lot lot worse of a life than than serving God. So once again, Christianity is not becoming a robot. It really is not. Um, obviously, you know, if you're a non-Christian watching this, then there is really nothing I can say to convince you. Uh, but if you are a Christian, just just keep keep your eyes focused on the goal, um, and you'll start to kind of see um, what I'm saying. Psalm 34, 8, O taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. So God is also... Um, uh, loving, First John four seven through nine. I hate when pages stick together. First John four seven through nine. And beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only son, only begotten Son into the world, so that we might live uh, through him. Don't forget that. You know, as a Christian, you're going to see people in the world act like the world, and it's going to irritate you. Don't forget that the people of the world act according to the world because they are of the world the light is the truth is not in them so they cannot possibly act in accord with god does that make sense i, I hope it does romans 5 6 through 9 and don't don't worry about about people ridiculing you non-christians will always ridicule christians it doesn't make sense to them uh, to live life for something else uh, because they are consumed with themselves that's just how it is i mean you you can argue with people, you can know all the answers, but in the end, people don't really care if you know the answers. They, um, by nature, want to try and disprove it. They, by nature, want to want to feel something real. And, um, you know, some you, you can't substitute the work of the Holy Spirit with having all the right words. For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though he perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. And Psalm 139, 1-6. God hates sin. It is against his character. Okay? So... God is wrathful against sin because in, in, it's in contrast with his character, and so he hates it. And so God's love of mankind demands justice on the sin, which if you ally yourself with the devil rather than with God, that's what you're doing. Um, Psalm 139, 1-6 says, O Lord, you have searched me and know, known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You understand my thoughts from afar. You scrutinize my paths and my lying down. 
and are intimately acquired with all my ways. Even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. I want to stop here and say, you know, if I'm saying things that, that you find confusing, I really am sorry. I'm not trying to confuse you. I'm trying to make it relevant for a lot of different Christian people. I don't want to teach things just for the new Christian. I don't want to teach things that, that the older Christian is just going to know and want to skip right over. So I'm trying to include a lot of different things. So if I say something that's confusing, just kind of hold off on it and, and keep on through the video. And then when I get to something that you understand again, focus on that. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? Because um, there, there's, there's th things in these classes for every stage of a Christian. Uh, you have enclosed me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain it. So loving, uh, good deeds do not earn God's love. We talked about this in the salvation lesson. Um, no matter what good things you do, it's not going to earn God's love. Failure does not cause him to stop loving you. God knows what mistakes you'll make, and he still loves you. He knows ahead of time. He knows who you are. He knows who you really are, not who you pretend to be, not who you show everybody else to be, who you actually are deep down inside. Uh, and he still loves you. So he's also, I mean, you could keep going with this. I mean, this isn't a systematic theology class, but... If you are interested in systematic theology, you can check out um, Wayne Grudem's Systematic Theology. Um, it is, it is. I, I don't agree with all of it because I'm not Calvinistic, but I mean, I. Um, it, it's very readable, very clear, very concise. I mean, a lot of the things that, not a lot of it, but some of the things I don't really agree with, I think that he sometimes draws a conclusion that's not really necessary. But, I mean... It's still good, and no matter who you are, you're going to, to to disagree with someone at some point, but you can still learn from everything. So, God is patient, he's long-suffering, he's merciful, he's full of grace, he's righteous, he's all-powerful, he's wrathful towards sin, he's completely separate from sin and imperfection, he's not far off, but not part of creation. Okay, in other words, he's not some God way out there, but he's not part of creation, okay? Um, God's character... The fact that God has a character and he has a personality shows that he's not part of creation. The fact that things in creation displease him shows that he's not part of creation. It shows that God has to be separate from that. Okay, So, yeah, God has revealed all about himself that he wants us to know in his word. There is no new revelation, especially not that one, one that contradicts, as that would make God unstable. See, if God contradicted himself, that would mean that God was not stable and he's not what wasn't really God. God, by definition has to uh, not contradict himself. He has to be the standard of truth. So, uh, even if it is from angels, even if there's a new revelation given from, new, uh, from angels, um, it cannot contradict what is in the Bible. And the Book of Mormon, for instance, does contradict the Bible. <sighs> okay, so, but God has revealed all, not, not necessarily everything about himself, but everything that he wants us to know about himself. Okay. Um, as Deuteron Deuteronomy 29, 29 said, the things that have been revealed are for us to know. Um, so there is no new revelation. Um, so even if you're in a Pentecostal church and they do give a word and it's contrary to the Bible, guess what? It was not from God. So this is just a – actually, we're going to get into that next time. I'm going kind of long on this one. I think I'm up by 40 minutes uh, now. Let me check. I am at 38 minutes, so I'm going to go ahead and stop there. Um, in the next lesson, I will I will finish talking about that. I'll talk about the Trinity, and then I'll talk about God's name. So, uh, thank you for watching.